My name is Alex Rodriguez. I'm out of the Aircraft Certification Office in Washington, D.C. So I deal a lot with the flight standards side as well with AFS 360, but I'm out of the AAR 132 uh, branch. So we do a lot of the guidance and policy regulations, work with AEA and all these organizations out there putting all these TSOs, the advisory circulars, that's all comes out of our office. And we also work with the ACO regional offices, all the FISDOs, we interact with them to help them understand what it is that our policies are intending to say. Um, which I'm sure a lot of you have had that discussion with them on what the intent really means. So some of the things I'm going to talk about is the overview of the ADSB mandate. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, already understand it, but I'll just give a, some highlights about it. Overview of FANS 1A, go into a little bit more detail on the ADSB deployment status, where are we, what, where, where are we with the uh, ground stations, what are we doing. Some of the benefits you get out of ADSB. So in both the overview of FANS 1A and in the benefits section, I'll talk a little bit about if you have that equipment today, what is it you will see in your aircraft. And then a little bit more on the performance monitor, just to give you an idea of what it is. I'm sure a lot of you have heard on the performance monitor. It used to be called compliance monitor. Um, people got sensitive to the fact that the FAA was saying compliance. So we kind of change it to performance, give them a nice, better, warm, fuzzy, not get them upset. So 2010, FAA came out and said, as of January 1st, 2020, you have to have ADSB out. Different from other uh, mandates, it's, it's an it's a airspace mandate. So in order to fly into certain airspace, you have to have the equipment. So 91225 talks about what airspace that is. Uh, if you're going to fly into, this is where you need to have the equipment. And 91227 talks about the level of the performance of the requirements that you have to meet in order to fly into that airspace. There are some exceptions similar to a transponder rule. Um, aircraft that weren't certificated with an electrical system or subsequently uh, don't need to have it, so gliders, balloons, uh, things like that. This is kind of a breakdown of the next slide, um, but I like the next slide better. It just talks about the different frequencies. In the US, we have the ability to use two frequencies to satisfy ADSB out. You have the 1090 extended squitter, which is the same frequency your transponder works on today. And then you have what they call the 978, the UAT. It's the same, uh, talks about the same equipment. UAT is operating the 978 frequency. And here's a couple different, depends on what you have in your aircraft, where you're going to fly, depends on what you need to equip with. But this is a slide that I like to use to kind of get that point across. So this breaks out the actual airspace of where it's required and what links are allowed in that airspace. So 18,000 feet and above class A airspace, at a minimum, you have to have 1090 extended squitter ADSB out. You can have 1090 and UAT out, but at a minimum, you have to have 1090 out. Below 18,000 feet, you can go either way. You can go 1090 extended squitter, or you can go UAT. If you go UAT, you have to maintain your transponder that you have in there today. So the transponder rule is not going away. You still have to have your existing transponder to satisfy the transponder rule, and the UAT will satisfy the ADSB rule. And that goes all the way down to class C, class B airspace. As you can see, it actually goes down to the airport surface. So the mode C veil goes down to the airport surface up to 10,000 feet, and then from 10,000 feet up, you have to have the airspace. So I like this chart because it kind of breaks down into 2D what and where is ADSB is required and what you're allowed to comply with in that airspace. Did you guys hear all that or do you, you good? I also like this one because it actually shows below 18,000, below 10,000 feet where is ADSB required? And as you can see, ADSB is not really required in a lot of airspace below 10,000 feet. A lot of the multi the in the East Coast, for example, you're, I mean, especially around here, you can't throw a rock without hitting Class B airspace. So um, it really gears more towards like in the Midwest where you see there isn't a lot of Class C, Class B airspace. So this is below 10,000 feet. Got a lot of questions all the time. Is oh well, how are we doing with equipage? Are we the ADSB mandate's going to move? I mean, I was just at Oshkosh. Oh, they're going to push out that ADSB mandate. There's no way it's going to hold. So I always like to put this in there because it's at Oshkosh. Every single event, all the AEA events, AOPA, every event our administrator goes to, all our executives, not just me, the engineer working headquarters, coming straight from the administrator saying the mandate will not get pushed. We're not pushing out the mandate. 
we have all our ground stations installed. I have a slide to show you all that. So the FA is actually ahead of where we said we were going to be. We installed, had all the ground stations operational. We have the performance monitor that's keeping track of the, air, the aircraft, making sure that they're operating and meeting the performance standards that's out there, that's used today. So we're, we're ready for the mandate. So give an overview of FANS 1A. So FANS 1A gives the pilot controllers the ability to talk to each other without actually having to use voice. So everything done via um, data. So it, it allows, gives them that link to be able to transfer their, their clearances, that information from the controller to the pilot without having to have that voice. So it frees up the controller to be able to use the voice comm for more efficient information, for more communication between pilots for other uses, not taking it up just to give out a clearance. So similar to what I showed before with the airspace map, this one kind of breaks down just to give an idea of how we're rolling out FANS 1A. So we've broken out into different phases. So you have segment one, phase one, which is your um, uh, departure clearances, ground departure clearances. Then we're moving to the en route and then trajectory. But the slide I think that really drives this is this one here. So phase one is our tower service. So actually today, if you have fans in your aircraft, you can actually take advantage of the DLCs, departure clearance, the DCLs, I'm sorry, the departure clearances. And I have a a slide that kind of goes over some of those airports that already have them. But that's being been rolled out since 2015, and we're actually coming up to finalizing that piece of it. The next phase, which we've already baseline, so we've actually gotten the funding to say, okay, FAA said this is what we're going to do, here's what we're going to implement, and we actually have the money allocated to start working on that process. So starting around 2019, we're going to start with segment one, phase two, which is all your en route service, and this is what you're going to get. And then this piece here has just got baseline in August, that third piece in yellow. So what this is saying is that's the first thing you're going to get. So today you can do DCLs. Starting 2019 on, we're going to start implementing this, and then route centers you are going to be able to do these and get these services. And then we already got the funding and the approval to go ahead. So around 2021, we'll start working on this piece. What you see down here is pretty much saying, well, do I need to have new avionics to be able to do these pieces? And the answer to that is, what you see in blue, green, and yellow can be done with your existing fans avionics. So you're not going to have to upgrade your avionics to be able to do those pieces. When we start moving to the dynamic RMP, advanced RMP, that's the kind of things they're looking down the pipeline of, well, what avionics equipment, what will I need to be able to do that? That's being worked on. So everything you see in, in light blue, green, and yellow are things we've said, okay, this is what the FAA is gonna do. We got a laundry list of things that people wanted us to do, which incorporated all these different things, speed, stuck microphone, and after a lot of discussions, we came up with the base and said, okay, this is what we know we'll be able to do, and this is what we, agree we are agreeing to do. And as you can see in the top, that's more or less when they're going to start working on each phase. So these airports here have already, are already using and have the capability to do departure clearances. And I have it here. I was going to put a big thing across that said outdated just for effect, but the FAA tends to frown upon those kind of things. Um, and the reason why I say outdated is because I, I know for a fact we already have, by the time I'm talking here today, two more airports that are already on this list. So they've, they've added them on, but because they weren't on yet, I couldn't put them on there. But they're, these are the airports that are using that service today. So if you have fans in your aircraft, and you're at these airports, you can actually take advantage of it today. And here's a list of all the people who have been, in, and plus some, who have been involved in getting this rolled out there. So we've been working with industry, not FAA alone making the decisions and working forward. With industry, we've cooperated, worked together through the RTCA committee to say, what, we want to make it useful. So how can we make it useful and make it effective? So these guys have all helped and gotten out there to help us do that. And this is just a summary of everything I just talked about. So tower service is, in, is pretty much almost completed. 
coordinating within the three next phase, which is the end route. So as I mentioned before, where are we today with the implementation for ADSB? All the ground stations are actually deployed, operational, and, and are using, we're using it for ADSB. So we're getting data. So the CONUS is covered. We have about 634 stations in the US to cover the US. We got Alaska. And then what you see down here is all these areas down here in the Gulf, we're always trying to expand to get better coverage. And also dealing with the fact that platforms are constantly closing, uh, opening new platforms. So we have to take that equipment and move it so we can maintain that coverage in that airspace. Since in this airspace here, particularly, we, don't, we only have ADSB coverage. We also like to point out that these three dots you see here is actually an effort we did with Mexico to be able to use their land to put ADSB stations. So we have FAA stations in Mexican territory to give us better coverage in this area of, of the Gulf. So we pretty much have the majority of the Gulf covered. Our artsy center, so essentially this slide, you see all the facilities and you see the, the blue where it's, uh, well you can't see it there, but the blue is completed and green is scheduled. But what this is saying is all those areas you see there are using ADSB out today as a primary source of surveillance. So when people talk about, well, ADSB out isn't being used, or if they call up their towers, they hear a lot of, hey, is my ADSB working? The controller goes, yeah, I got radar contact. No, it was my ADSB working, man. I don't know. You got radar contact. To them, the way we've designed the system is to have it basically as seamless as possible for the controller. So even though he's using ADSB out information's primary source of surveillance, let me see if this. So even though ADSB out is being used as primary source of surveillance, he may not, and he doesn't know it, it's there. So basically I showed those slides to kind of say, drive in the fact of people go, well, yeah, they're FAA, they have to say the mandate's not gonna move. Ground stations are in place. We're using ADSB out as primary source of surveillance. I mean, we're, we're set to go forward. Even though some people may call the controller and say, hey, is it working? They, they go, oh, the controller doesn't even know they're using it. It's there. So what are some of the benefits you get from ADSB today? So let me see if I can shift this over. that better? Can you guys see the edges there? Oh. So what are some of the benefits you get from ADSB today? So today you get, if you have ADSB out, that benefits us, the FAA. We get faster update rates. We get faster information on where you're going, what you're doing. Um, gives the controller a better understanding of what's in his environment. So where's the benefit for the folks in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, airspace is on the ADSB in side. So if you have ADSB out and you have the capability to receive ADSB in, then you get these services, which essentially what you see on the left-hand corner is your ADSB air-to-air. -air. And really, you could actually even draw a line between 1090 and UAT. Since you have these dual in receivers, they could actually see both UAT and 1090 directly. So for those who have a single means of ADSB in, They'll see each, anybody who's ADSB out on their airspace directly. Dual receive can see both. ADSR, so for those guys who don't have that dual capability, what we do is if you're inside of an ADSB ground station, it'll get that person's information. So you're telling us, hey, I'm UAT out. And in your UAT out, you're telling me what ADSB in you can receive. I can receive UAT, I can receive 1090, I can receive both. That tells us what information you're missing to be able to give you that picture of what's around you. So if you're in on one frequency, we'll take all those other guys who are in your airspace, and I'll show you what that, what that kind of looks like. Take all those guys, take that information, and send it up to you in a format that we know you can receive. You're telling us, I can receive on UAT. He's 1090, we know you can't get him, so we'll take all that information and send it to you on that frequency, and vice versa. So that's called ADS rebroadcast. If you're dual receive, 
this goes away. Why? We don't need to send you something you can already receive. Why are we going to take up your, your time and your equipment to process information you already have? If you're UAT in, you can get weather information, that's the FISB, Flight Information Services. So we'll send that information up to you only on the UAT frequency. That doesn't get transmitted on the 1090 frequency. And then TISB. That one is all those guys who are in your airspace who don't have ADSB out, but they have a transponder and they're in radar coverage. We'll take them and go, okay, you can't get these guys because they're transponder, they can only be seen by the radar. So it takes those guys and sends it up to you, again, on whatever frequency you tell us you can receive it on. So now what do you see? You see all those guys who are ADSB out in your airspace. You see guys who have transponder who are in radar coverage in your airspace. And then if you have the UAT in, you get the weather. So as I said, rebroadcast, I explained this, kind of goes in and takes all the information on the opposite frequency, sends it up to you. you. All line of sight, so you have to be in line of sight of a radio station, ADSB ground station, to get it. TISB, again. So the hockey puck. And I added this in here because I can explain it, but I'm a visual guy. I like to see what, when you're trying to explain what, you're, what it is. So what we do is, because your ADSB out, you're telling us your position, your altitude, and what you can receive. So what we'll do, we'll say, okay, your ADSB out and you're meeting our minimum bar to be a client. So we say, hey, here's this guy flying our airspace, ADSB out, we know where he's at, we know his altitude, we know he can receive information. So we create what we call the hockey puck. It's 15 nautical mile radius and plus or minus 3,500 feet. And when you dry it out, it creates a hockey puck. So anyone flying in your airspace, all those TISB guys I talked about, all those ADSR guys I talked about, all those guys flying in your hockey puck will send to you. If they're outside your hockey puck, we won't send them to you because we established to say, okay, what's really his area of concern? So we establish that hockey puck. Anyone in that volume gets sent up to you. And ADSR is plus or minus 5,000 feet, but I always tell people it's plus or minus 3,500. If it's better, then you, and you get more information. But for the most part, you, can, you know that plus or minus 3,500 feet, 15 nautical mile radius from your aircraft, you have a hockey puck. And that moves with you. So that as you're flying in your airspace, that hockey puck is moving. Here's some of the FISB products that you get today. Uh, we're actually working on five new products that are going to send up by the end of this year, I believe, and that's going to be um, icing, uh, turbulence, winds aloft. Yeah, there's, there's five products. I can't, and lightning strikes, I can't remember all five, but um, there's going to be five new products that are coming out, and that'll be sent up in that information as well, all on UAT. Any questions so far? Yeah. Who would want why someone who has TCAS would want ADSB in? Yes. So the question is if I have TCAS, why do I want ADSB in? So the difference between for the TCAS and the ADSB in piece is for ADSB in you can actually get aircraft at a further distance than you would with TCAS. Um, you can actually, for ADSB and receivers, you can get receivers up to like, uh, I wish Carmen was here, I think. Well, from the ground system. If you have an ADSB and receiver, for example, it's still received, that's as good as as far out you can, you can, you can get information on. For the ground system. So the ground system creates that hockey puck 15 miles out. Your ADSB and receiver can see further than that if, it, if you want, if it, as good as the sensitivity of the receiver is, which is further than 15 miles. So you have better situational awareness around you. Um, so today, and on top of that, not everybody has TCAS, but today, um, you're correct. I mean, TCAS gives you that mode, it still has that active interrogation, um, but you get that better, that other aircraft around you who aren't mode AC, which not that many. I mean, there isn't a really good, right now, benefit for having ADSB in with TCAS except that you get more aircraft that are not maybe outside of the range of your TCAS. 
Yeah. So, for example, our receivers, our ground station receivers can see up to 200. Um, some of these guys are 90 miles. Um, it depends on how good the receivers are. Yeah, I understand. Uh, what we're doing is, uh, for example, with TCAS, we're actually, there is a TSO now that actually is for hybrid TCAS. So we're move, we're transitioning to actually leverage ADSB out. So anyone who's developing a brand new TCAS today has to make it a hybrid TCAS. And as we move forward, ACAS X, which is the, I call the next generation TCAS, what that's doing is it's leveraging ADSB out. And I should have added a slide in there. Um, today you have that active interrogation, so it requires you to, I picked you up, now I'm gonna actively go back and forth to keep track of you. We're leveraging the fact that it's putting out this information to do a, more of a passive acquisition. So at further distances, it's gonna be able to keep track of aircraft and go, okay, I have aircraft at further difference, distances. Won't show them on your display, but it'll know it's there. And as it transitions in closer to you, it already has that, that track on them, for lack of a better word and then it can transition to an active interrogation at that point. So it already knew who was there and it was keeping track of him so he can actually realize, hey, I'm gonna have a problem before, to, like today, where you go, well, I have a problem here. It gives, them, it gives the equipment the capability to keep track of those aircraft to deal with an issue before it actually deals with the issue today. So that's where we're moving towards with the TCAS is leveraging ADS-B out to get that information, passively acquire them at a further distance since we know we can receive them at a further distance, and then as he gets closer, we'll transition to active. That way you're getting that back and forth to make sure you get that resolution before something occurs. So top, you're asking to operate above 18,000 feet, you only need 1090? Correct, so you, you only need 1090 extended squitter at 18,000 feet or above. Ten ninety satisfies the ADSB rule at any altitude. Eighteen thousand feet and above, you you can use UAT, but you have to have ten ninety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you could have you could have UAT out and in. You you could have dual receive at, at any altitude. You could have. UAT out above 18,000, but you have to have 1090 extended squitter out at 18,000 feet and above. You could also have a UAT out at 18,000 feet and above, but you have to have that 1090. Does that answer your question? The last one, yeah. The one about the, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you, at 18,000 at minimum, you have to have 1090. Below that, you can do either or, or if you have 1090, then you're satisfying at, at every altitude. So the performance monitor. So what we did was we said, we have a biannual check for transponders. We said, do we need a biannual check for ADSB? So instead of going out and doing a two year check for ADSB, we said, let's create this performance monitor. What the performance monitor does is every time an aircraft flies in, ADS, in coverage, ADSB coverage, we're actually doing a check on the aircraft. And the reason for that is because unlike transponders, there's a lot more interaction that ADSB has with other systems on the aircraft. You have some with transponder here, you have a lot more interaction with other systems on the aircraft. So this performance monitor gives us the ability to go, hey, is this aircraft trending out? Or do we see a trend with one manufacturer over another that we see they're having issues with installations as well? So it gives us the ability to go, hey, there's a, this aircraft is transitioning out of compliance. We let him know before he gets out of compliance. That way he's not flying and then the controller goes, oh, hey, you can't get in my airspace. Your ADSP is not working. So in order, so if you're flying in ADSP, if you're ADSB out, let's say 2022, and you're flying in the airspace, if your ADSP isn't working, there's gonna be a chi difference on the controller. This is what I said, it was a, there's gonna be a subtle difference, but if everything's working, he won't really know the difference. That'll tell him, hey, this guy's either not ADSB equipped or his ADSB is not working. And at that point, he can tell you, hey, uh, your ADSB is not working, or he'll say, are you ADSB equipped? There, there's gonna be a language that's relayed uh, that's gonna have that information go, 
you can't come in or yeah, you know, land, but your ADSP is not working. There's, there's going to be some language that will be uh, established. But what this does is it get rid of that annual, that biannual check. So you don't have, you still have to do your biannual check on the transponder, but you don't have to do anything in addition to ADSB. So what it does is it'll give us, right now it gives us a trend on how many people are equipping with ADSB. Uh, do we see what are the issues we're seeing in the airspace with configuration? Um, it, maybe certain equipment with software issues, and even on the ground side, if there's a software issue or something we see on the ground side, it's something we correct. So it's it's a way to monitor the airspace with ADSB, and it generates these ADSB out performance reports. So if you go off and you get, and I think I have, yeah. So what we call the public performance reports. So there's actually a way for if you're an install shop or an operator and you want to see how your ADSB is working, you can actually go in and request with your tail number for a performance report and it'll come back, it's sanitized, it won't say who you are, where you flew, it'll just say this is how your equipment's performing. And you'll know if, you're, if your equipment's within uh, meeting the performance standards or not. So that actually is live today. Before you used to have to email this address with your end number, what equipment you have, and it will send you that report. You can actually go in and you can pretty much get it right away. You don't, there's a long, this is an email address, but if you go to the Equip ADSB website, which is at the end of this slide, um, this same, there'll be a link in there and it'll take you to that report. So if you want to see how my aircraft is doing or, you know, my installation was okay, this is, some, this is something you can use. The aircraft obviously has to go up and fly in the airspace, but once it does that, you can get these reports. And then on my side, the certification side, we use it in order to do STCs for analysis. So in every initial pairing between that ADSB and that GPS, and that's key is the ADSB alone doesn't give you meet the doesn't meet the rule. It's a combination between the ADSB and the GPS that meets the rule. So all those initial pairings have to go do a flight test. They ask for the data. We actually analyze it and go, okay, here's the data. We saw something or we didn't see anything. And that's what this email address, which is in the advisor circular, that's what you would use. So this website, I always put it in there because it has a lot of information on what is ADSB out, where is it required, the links to the performance reports, and it also it, it, a lot of FAQs. So anything you want to know regarding ADSB out and and how do I get my performance reports, that link will actually take you there and it actually covers all of that. And I added this gentleman's name on there because he is our Datacom team lead. So he's our expert with fans and everything that has to do with Datacom. So if there's anything really specific you want to know or were curious about in terms of uh, the Datacom side with fans, he would be the right person to answer those questions. He's on all those committees working with all those industry guys rolling that out. 